As you can see from the slides, my name is Robert Wood. I work for Sigital. I'm our director of our red team assessment practice. Um, Sigital focuses mostly on AppSec stuff, but uh, we're moving into other uh, realms of security, including red teaming. Uh, this talk, um, so I came from a from a red teaming, a strict red teaming and uh, kind of forensics background and kind of brought that into Sigital and we kind of melded all of the AppSec assessment services there and all of my background and we kind of developed a new approach that isn't really being adopted by a lot of companies uh, out and about in the uh, in the industry. So I'm going to discuss that approach, uh, you know, why uh, we think it's beneficial, you know, how you can get, you know, the most out of a red team assessment if you guys are doing them internally or running them, standing them up, um, you know, scaling some things, bringing software into the picture because, of course, we're all software-centric individuals. So, uh, again, that is me. Um, I've worked in a lot of different capacities. Um, you know, most currently I'm uh, working as the practice director at Sigital. Um, I still do a lot of assessment work, uh, anything from embedded device hacking up to, uh, you know, a lot of web stuff, a lot of code review. I've done a lot of really messed up oddball assessments. Um, so uh, I've pretty much spanned the, uh, the gamut of security <laughs> assessments. Um, and I've worked in software network stuff, uh, physical pen testing, which I'll get into here, um, social engineering stuff, mobile stuff. Um, all over the map, so jack of all trades uh, kind of approach. So red teaming in general. Um, so uh, we were just having this conversation up here. Um, it actually it's it's not a new term. It's it's been around for years and years and years, and it comes from uh, kind of military war gaming. And so military strategists used to use it. You know, they would develop a strategy on how you know they're either going to secure their base or attack an opponent or you know do some kind of like tactical move. And they would they would approach it essentially from an adversary's perspective. So how would our adversaries, be it, uh, you know, some terrorist group, be it, you know, our enemy that we've declared war on, whoever that may be, how are they going to break this plan down? And then how are we going to subsequently respond to that when they do X, Y and Z? Um, so that that term, that approach to evaluating something, evaluating the security posture of something, whether it's an organization, a plan, whatever it happens to be has kind of morphed and evolved into the InfoSec world. Um, so we're going to cover, uh, you know, what the current industry standard approach is, because you will see this out and about. Like if you Google red teaming InfoSec, you're going to see a lot of different references in a lot of different places. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are taking the adversarial approach. I'm going to discuss where some of that may come up short um, and why this new approach, at least we believe, you know, once it kind of gets adopted in a lot of places throughout the industry that it's hopefully going to provide a lot more value to companies who are doing this kind of assessment. Um, and part of that is uh, a big reliance on point in time risks, which I'll discuss uh, some elements of what makes a successful red team bringing software into it all. Um, you know, again, because Sigital is soft, a software company and of course we're all software people. Um, and then scaling it up to uh, doing some kind of continuous red teaming. So, uh, you know, a lot, we're moving into a point now where we have continuous uh, application scanning, continuous network scanning. And that way we can detect changes and trends over time, you know, as they occur in our environments and our infrastructures. And so we can do the same thing with red teaming, given a lot of the, uh, the elements overlap. So how is it different than a regular pen test. So as I mentioned before, um, it's all about, uh, you know, evaluating something from an adversarial perspective, which, you know, some may say, duh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pen test an application or I'm looking at something from an architectural perspective. I'm looking at how it can be attacked. Here, we're all about looking at it from a goal-based perspective. So instead of just going on a bug hunt where, you know, I'm evaluating, you know, xyzbank.com and I'm trying to find as many SQL injection and as many cross-site request forgery, as many cross-site scripting issues that I can on xyzbank.com. Here, we're going to take XYZ Bank as an organization. We're going to define some set of goals, whether it's, you know, they're trying to protect their secret recipe to investing, uh, they're trying to protect their customers' data, whatever that happens to be, and we're going to throw the kitchen sink at them with assessment <laughs> approaches to accomplish whatever goal that we set out. And we're going to map that back to whatever their business goals are and subsequent business risks to those goals. Um, it's more of an organizational assessment versus testing a specific target in a vacuum. So, you know, if you're doing a pen test or, you know, any kind of security analysis on XYZBank.com, you're oftentimes just looking at that one little slice of the organization. 
you're not going to consider. So if you find a, if you find a vulnerability in, in that site, we don't really know what the risk is to things external to that site. Um, so in doing a red team assessment, because we have a much broader scope, we can see how one issue over here may impact things way over here in the organization. And you may not be able to connect the dots if you're too close to the problem. Um, another thing is we're going to be able to measure how an organization actually responds to an attack. So in a lot of cases, when you're doing uh, security assessments, you're going to be, you know, you kind of get all your white, your IP addresses whitelisted and it's very controlled. It's very uh, predictable in terms of how, how the, you know, the organization knows you're coming. You have test windows that you're going to operate in here. You know, we want to see, because we, you know, our, our clients do hire, you know, they do have incident response teams on staff. I've worked with them. I've been a part of them. Um, you know, we want to see how they handle certain attacks. If, if we go after a certain system or a certain, uh, you know, part of their network or whatever the case may be, or we're abusing some uh, particular functionality, we want to see how they respond to that. Do they shut us out? Do they, uh, you know, do they blacklist our IPs for a little bit? Uh, you know, how do we get around that? You know, is there some kind of scramble internally uh, that may distract attention from something more important? Uh, so maybe we create a distraction over here and then slip in over here. Um, so it's all about, you know, seeing how you respond in that situation. Um, a lot of this, um, it incorporates a lot of different testing services. So this talk is going to be more about the process involved in conducting a successful red team. And, you know, in doing so, you know, it's just like stepping through an SDLC. It does have very technical components, obviously, you know, developing the code, stepping through design, doing static analysis, all of that stuff. Here, you know, while we're conducting the red team, we're going to pull in very technical components of it. If we have to assess, uh, you know, a particular application or a particular uh, embedded device or bypass some access control technology, we're going to pull in an expert who can do that, uh, do that particular testing. Although from a high level, we're not necessarily concerned about that. That's just one more black box that we have to get around, you know, to move one step further in our attack tree that we develop. Um, and the last thing is it's going to evaluate how an adversary is actually going to attack an organization. So, again, in, in connecting the dot risks, um, you know, we may not be able to see, you know, uh, well, we're, you know, kind of assigning risk likelihoods to, uh, to XYZBank.com. You know, we may think that this vulnerability is, is super important as security consultants and you need to scramble and, you know, allocate all your resources to fixing that one particular thing. And it's going to be a fire drill when in actuality, you know, an attacker may not, they may not give a shit about it. You know, they might just kind of go about their business and, you know, that may not help them achieve whatever goal they're going after. Um, because ultimately, if an attacker can get access to customer data, however they do it, you know, they don't really care. They just want the customer data. Um, so that's what we're trying to emulate here. So some basic elements of a red team, you have, you know, kind of the electronic sphere, the social uh, sphere, the physical sphere, and they all overlap with each other. And this, that's the typical, uh, you know, if you, if you watch any other uh, presentations on red team and you'll see that, that traditional Venn diagram, I threw on the, uh, the other little bits of recon and more in the center there um, because it is a lot more involved than just looking at those different assessment components. Because really, if, if you just, you know, kind of throw money at each of those little testing problems and you're not connecting the dots and, you know, putting this big picture together, then you're, you're not doing any better than just a string, another string of assessments. Um, so we're going to move one step, one step past that. So some of the things that you may consider in the electronic sphere. So obviously, you know, we have our software, you know, you have a lot of web apps, you know, big organizations may have thousands of applications in their portfolio. You know, you've got thick clients, you've got mobile applications, um, all these things handling, you know, whatever sensitive data your organization is, is you know, there to protect. Um, you've got network stuff. So, you, you know, maybe your stuff is in Amazon on uh, AWS. Maybe it's, you know, you have your internal network, you have, you know, your external network infrastructure. You've got wireless networks on your office, you know, on site at your offices. All that stuff connects and, you know, is kind of inter intertwined, uh, you know, to support your organization. Uh, the mobile technologies, you've got embedded technologies. So all this stuff may come into play in conducting these kinds of assessments. So the social stuff, uh, you know, this is all pretty basic. Uh, you know, an attacker may run through phishing attacks on your employees. Those are easy. Phone-based attacks, IM chat, social media. Those are all super easy. You know, we all know about this stuff. We all know it's bad. We all know we shouldn't click on links. And we try telling people, but nobody ever listens. Uh, so it is. Keeps us all in business, right? Um, we have physical security attacks. So, uh, 
you know, we'll, we'll get into a, a couple of uh, little stories uh, in a little while, um, you know, me getting arrested in particular with uh, regards to this stuff. But, you know, getting uh, getting into actually uh, entering into another uh, into an organization's facility, getting past certain access control technologies, be it, uh, you know, RFID badges or, uh, you know, some kind of like biometric scanners. Um, Cause there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways around a lot of these different technologies. Um, access badge processes. If you, you know, maybe get, get together a business card. If I print out somebody's business card and, you know, Hey, I forgot my card, you know, this is like my second day on the job or, you know, whatever. Can I get in? Uh, or can you just give, give me a new like temporary badge to get into the building? A lot of times they're going to be like, sure, unless you have, you know, a really secure facility and they're actually going to go through and check. Um, I was actually with one organization where I, I walked in and kind of made myself an employee. And I was, you know, I worked there for like a month. You know, I was doing the social engineering assessment, but I worked there for a month. I was getting invited to like potluck lunches and, um, and I eventually got sick of tailgating. So I went down and, uh, you know, told security. I was like, you know, I've been here for a month now. You guys still haven't given me a badge. Like, what gives? And they're like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, you know, here's your here's your badge. Like, <laughs> we're sorry for the inconvenience. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all sorts of things to consider. And once, you know, once you're on the inside, a lot of people, uh, you know, in the network testing realm, they're like, well, how are you going to get past our super secure firewalls? How are you going to do this, this, this? You know, I've got all these uh, configurations in place. I'll just, I'll just walk past it. You know, your firewall won't stop, won't stop that. Um, so you got to incorporate all these things and an attacker is going to incorporate all these things into how they come after you, depending on their level of sophistication. So some other activities that we're going to consider here, um, obviously reconnaissance is a big one. We can't just kind of willy nilly, uh, just start like launching packets and launching requests at things and just start reversing some things. And it doesn't work like that. So you have to prep, you have to, you know, start to build a picture of what that organization looks like and then how you're going to decompose it and break it down and get to your, uh, your attack paths. You have to build some kind of threat model, either developing it physically and writing it all down or just jotting it on a whiteboard and, you know, getting your ideas up there, you know, develop some kind of threat model, uh, looking at business processes that kind of support the organization. So how do they handle password resets for employees, for customers? How do you, um, you know, issue security badges, There's all sorts of processes in place, whether it's, uh, you know, for a bank, maybe you have uh, like debit and credit card activation steps. You know, is there ways around that if, uh, you know, if you're going through the technical route of achieving that process, you know, there may be certain controls in place like brute force uh, enumeration is, you know, is not allowed or something like that. If you call up a customer service rep, maybe you get around a lot of those controls. Um, So it's important to map those things out and see how you may be able to get around controls um, that are in place. Again, threat intelligence and threat modeling. Um, Using this, you know, once we do some kind of uh, cursory threat analysis, we can we can match up an adversary's objectives, their capabilities, the risks that we identify in a in an organization. Map that to you know what may actually happen, so we can lay out a whole bunch of antecedent conditions, and you know we can actually kind of predict or you know postulate a little bit where an uh, where an adversary may be likely to spend their resources in attacking you. Uh, again, we can measure how an organization responds to attacks. Uh, risk management is a big one. So, you know, a lot of times if you're going after XYZ Bank, XYZBank.com is probably going to be their flagship application. They're going to put all their resources into defending that. But if there's shared assets across a lot of applications that are maybe linked, they have, you know, shared credentials somewhere else or, you know, some kind of SSO uh, functionality where you've got a cookie over here that's not protected on a very you know, lame app that's connected to xyzbank.com, you attack that site and then you use it to kind of pivot into xyzbank.com, you know, that's something that you, uh, that an attacker is going to consider that, you know, their risk management processes may not because this little, you know, lame site over here is not as important to them. And, you know, I'll, I'll walk through an example of how, uh, uh, of an actual red team that we worked on that, uh, that proved to be very successful. Um, role-based social engineering. And so instead of just doing kind of this point in time social engineering where I'm going after, you know, Jane Doe on Facebook who likes to, you know, disclose all this crazy information and, you know, that's the only way into an organization I can find. That's not very valuable for an organization because they, if you replace Jane Doe or you just tell her, you know, stop doing that and she stops, then, you know, the, the whole organization, everything that you just kind of reported on goes away. In, in some cases, um, whereas if you target role, but, you know, obviously we want to look at those things cause they are important, but we don't want to limit ourselves to those things. So if we look at role based social engineering, where we're, we're social engineering, the role of a customer support rep and, you know, they don't have controls in place to protect themselves 
uh, from being social engineered. So it's kind of human agnostic where anybody who is in that role is susceptible to social engineering. That's where we want to uh, target them. And, you know, that's where we want to actually help organizations improve their processes. So, you know, maybe put this control in place and your CSR roles aren't going to fall susceptible to this, you know, very basic kind of phone based attack or chat based attack, whatever it happens to be. Um, those are all sort of things that we kind of consider in this scheme of, uh, you know, new age red teaming. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, and the, the current industry approach, you know, if you look at a lot of companies, you know, go look at like conference talks, go look at, you know, get on the phone with salespeople and, you know, ask them, you know, how they do this stuff. It essentially looks like this. And it's pretty lame. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty short sighted. So a lot of people are very, you know, network pen testing, as you guys probably already know, is very, very commodity right now. It's, it's, it's easy to do. There's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of frameworks out there. There's, you know, you've got Metasploit, which kind of covers pretty much everything. So a lot of people, they'll just take Metas, they'll load up their Metasploit framework, you know, MSF update, you know, I'm all, yeah, I'm all set. They'll, uh, you know, do a little bit of recon, find some employees, you know, maybe launch a few phishing emails. They'll, you know, load up some, uh, uh, embed MSF, uh, like reverse payload or something into a PDF. I'm going to send a bunch of those in, send like 500 e phishing emails, you know, one person will click on it because clicking on stuff is fun and they'll get a reverse shell. They'll maybe do a little bit of internal network hacking and, and pretty much it, you know, may, some people, some guys expand into the physical pen testing. Some don't, you know, it's kind of, eh, you know, some people just enjoy it. Some people, uh, kind of shy away from it. And then essentially, once you get that, you know, they'll just get into the network or break into a system. And then they write up a report and they're like, this is what we did. We owned you, even though we didn't get anything important. And they'll run away and they'll send you an invoice and that'll be that. And they're not there to actually help you kind of understand where your problems may lie, um, which is unfortunate because, you know, as organizations, you know, we want to spend our money and actually figure out where our problems are. That's why we do pen tests. That's why we do you know, code reviews. That's why we do these things internally and uh, bring in vendors to do this stuff. We want to understand where our problems are and we don't want to just know our problems. We want to fix our problems. Uh, so we want to actually decompose them and figure out what the root causes are to these things. Um, so report run an invoice is not an effective strategy for this. So uh, we kind of stepped through this. Uh, you know, why is this, why is this flawed? Um, a lot of tax today, a lot of attacks today, you know, we see all these things in the news. A lot of them take place at the application layer. If you're just running Metasploit payloads on, you know, tied to phishing emails or trying to pop shells on out of date boxes, then, you know, you're missing a lot of critical stuff. Um, you know, xyzbank.com may have all this, all these critical SQL injection issues that allow you to get past authentication, siphon money, uh, uh, you know, into other people's accounts, uh, all sorts of you know, crazy stuff. And, you know, if we're if I'm just running Metasploit, I'm not going to see any of that stuff. Um, there's also a lot of reliance on quick win techniques. So, you know, again, targeting Jane Doe, who's kind of spewing all her information out on Facebook and Twitter and who's very susceptible to social engineering attacks. It doesn't really tell us how the organization operates as a whole. It tells us that Jane Doe, you know, she needs some help. Uh, and it doesn't really tell us how they're going to respond to that. You know, maybe they maybe they fire Jane Doe. Maybe they give her training. But. All in all, it's a very, very, you, you know, you only get this little tiny slice of, you know, what's wrong. You know, Jane Doe is wrong. You don't know that, you know, there's all sorts of other stuff in your organization that may be flawed. So the point in time risk uh, reliance. All right, we're doing good on time. Uh, so the point in time risk reliance. So a lot of these are like very targeted phishing attacks, um, you know, Say I, I send in uh, I send in my phishing emails with the with the uh, Metasploit reverse payload reverse TCP payload in a PDF. Somebody clicks on it, and I happen to get on you know maybe I get on like a CTO's computer. You know he's going to have some kind of crazy information on his hard drive. Maybe he has some passwords or something that he doesn't want to bother to uh, you know to actually remember. So he puts them all in an Excel spreadsheet, or he's got them linked in a share somewhere um, that are you know. I've, I've seen this in so many, like countless organizations. It's so bad. Um, but LinkedIn, like a share with, you know, with no, uh, you know, no authentication or anything. And you can just hop over to that share, grab your sensitive information and you just jump right to the point of, you know, I, I accomplished what I needed. And it was all based on that one little, you know, risk that this guy clicked on an email and that's it. 
Um, and then after that point, we're going to run away. We're going to write a report and we're going to send you an invoice for, you know, $50,000 and peace. So again, not, not really effective. Uh, you know, it has its importance. Uh, you know, obviously we want to try to highlight in those, in those kind of cases, we want to highlight why was this actually possible? You know, was it possible because, you know, maybe you're not, you don't have effective, uh, desktop level, uh, malware scanning that would have picked up on, you know, that PDF sitting there or sitting on your, uh, on your email servers or something that would have kicked that back prior to getting to the CTO's inbox. You know, a lot of times these, these things don't come into the picture where you actually try to understand the root cause of why this point in time risk was allowed, you know, allowed to happen. Um, and that's important so that we can fix the root cause, subsequently fix the problem. So elements for a successful red team. So we have, you know, scaling it up, we have expanding it, and we have, you know, ultimately, hopefully securing our, our organizations. Um, you know, fingers crossed, that's the, that's the end goal once we uh, get all this money in place. So successful red teaming. So, you know, like I said before, we always want to consider what the threat model is, whether, you know, we're, we're writing that down on a whiteboard, whether we're, you know, formally crafting, you know, Visio diagrams and all this elaborate threat modeling stuff like we would in a software case. Um, we want to conduct some level of a threat actor analysis. So I alluded to this before, but really that's all about, you know, defining, uh, you know, are you really concerned about hacker groups? You know, what are hacker groups motivations? You know, maybe they don't really care about, uh, you know, disclosing customer data. They just want to bring you down or, you know, do a denial of service attack. That sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, hopefully that's not correct. Um, that's good. Um, you know, maybe that you, you want to consider what their actual objectives are in terms of attacking your organization. You know, other different threats are going to have different objectives. You want to consider what their capabilities are. You know, a, a script kitty who's running Metasploit and, you know, doing his Metas, MSF update, uh, you know, use exploit, blah, 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 uh, you know, set all this and then run is going to have a lot different capabilities than a nation state who may be coming after a defense contractor, you know, a Lockheed Martin or a Boeing or something like that. Um, you really want to take those into account because if you're, if you're reporting on an issue that, you know, only a nation state could potentially exploit or find, and you, you know, you're, you're telling people that, you know, this is like, you know, run rampant throughout your organization. This is very likely to happen. You know, everyone, uh, everyone and their mothers are going to be loading up, uh, you know, the next tool and exploiting you here. Um, you know, you, you don't want to cause panic within your, within your clients or, you know, internally, if you're doing this stuff internally. Um, so always consider adversaries capabilities. And then once you, once you get all that done, you can map those things back to risks that you actually identify. So if I find that a criminal organization, you know, has, you know, they're, they're concerned with getting financial data and probably selling it or using it themselves to kind of siphon money out of accounts. Um, you know, they have the capabilities, they have, you know, the capabilities to go on site and do physical, uh, you know, physical entry into a building. They have the capability, you know, they can hire very advanced technical people. And of course, you know, they have all sorts of SQL injection issues. We can kind of postulate that this is probably pretty likely to happen if it hasn't already. Um, we should probably fix this, given all of these kind of conditions that are in place. Um, at the beginning of any kind of red team assessment, whether, you know, you're a vendor doing these things or, you know, you're doing these things internally, you want to figure out what your business goals are. And from those business goals, whether it's protect business data or make sure that this service is up and available for customers, I just did. Uh, I just finished up a big red team assessment, actually, and it was all about it was all about service. They didn't really care if stuff got out. Um, it was all about service. So it was anything that could, uh, you know, like page rewriting attacks that would cause people to, like lose faith in the system and and run away or cause it to like you know uh, this is confusing. It must not be working for the day, and then stop using it. Um, they were more concerned about that stuff or obviously bringing the entire system down than people's data getting out because it was kind of public data. Um, it, was, it was kind of an interesting assessment. Um, and then from the, from the goals that you identify, you, you lay out some risks. So, you know, risk may be targeted deni uh, distributed denial of service attacks, maybe application layer attacks on, you know, your Tomcat instance that, you know, cause it to run, uh, go down or some kind of .NET flaw or something like that because um, there's plenty of those out there. Um, and you always want to consider the bigger picture for any risks that are identified. Um, so I'll give a, I'll give a story that, that pulls that into, uh, pulls that into a bigger perspective in just a moment. Um, but you know, if we're, if we're looking at our XYZbank.com and we find risks that, you know, are on, 
you know, abc.xyzbank.com or, you know, investor.xyzbank.com. And that's kind of a low risk application for them. They're not really caring. They don't really care about that. But again, they have shared assets, you know, shared credentials, shared, shared something, uh, you know, shared secrets between those apps, between the flagship and the low risk app. Um, you know, you want to consider the big picture. If some, if something happens over here that can be subsequently used to attack that, that larger entity or that larger, more high profile application, then it, it needs to be taken seriously. You know, that, that's no longer a low risk scenario. Um, and one of the other things is trying to identify security themes across the, across the organization. So instead of just identifying single bugs in a, in a, you know, a whole bunch of applications, say if we do a baseline scan of every application in your portfolio that we consider in scope for the assessment, you know, are you, you know, consistently lacking output encoding? Are you consistently, you know, not using parameterized queries when you're writing, uh, when you're doing any kind of SQL database stuff? Um, you know, we identify these themes and then we can say, you know, with a somewhat uh, level of certainty that, you know, you're, as an organization, you guys are not implementing these security policies down to your developers. You guys, you know, co- constantly are lagging behind in your patch management. You know, we're, we're constantly finding these same versions that are always vulnerable in your organization. And that's where the continuous uh, red teaming comes into place to a degree. Um, but if I'm just reporting on these single little bugs, I don't know that it's a problem across the organization because if they if they don't have a patch management problem, if they're not you know pushing out secure coding guidelines, things like that, you know that's going to be a much larger issue where you can you can implement things something once and then fix all these things pushed out the line. So uh, moving into threat modeling and threat analysis, uh, just wanted to drill down just a little bit into the specific uh, you know success component. Um, so building out the entire attack surface across the organization or across the scope rather, ideally in a red team, you want it to be the entire organization. Sometimes that's not feasible. If you have, you know, an enormous, you know, multinational bank, you know, they may not, they're like, you know, holy shit, like we're not going to spend like $500,000 on this red team assessment because it's going to take you guys forever to, to figure out everything. So they may limit you to, you know, one big system for instance, or, uh, you know, a, a component of their, or, you know, kind of a section of their, of their enterprise. So building out the attack surface across the entire scope. So whether that's, you know, uh, areas, all the areas of input that you see, uh, you know, all the different network ranges that you got, uh, different business processes that support it. So, you know, where, where are their, uh, you know, CSR, you know, like call us functions that, you know, help, uh, help me through this specific functionality. Um, are there account registration functionalities uh, on these sites that apply to these other ones? Uh, things like that. So this process helps you kind of put together these components and build composite attacks. So a composite attack, at least how we define it, is something that uh, when you consider an attack tree, so you, you start out over here and your end goal is to get over here, stepping through each node in that attack tree. Um, it's something that's kind of going to step across domains. So maybe you you start with an application attack, move into a network attack, end with a social attack, or you know vice versa on the whole thing. But it, it takes into account multiple domains and multiple steps to get to where you're you're at. And if you're looking at a single point in time risk, then you're not going to see the bigger picture and see that these bigger risks or these bigger attacks can be accomplished. Um, so we are already kind of covered this with the uh, the threat and. Uh, threat analysis. Um, and the other thing to consider with that is, uh, you know, does a certain threat actor actually have visibility into the attack surface where, you know, you think they may be going after? So, you know, maybe they, uh, you know, maybe you're considering like a, like a low tech, um, just like a malicious user threat actor. Um, so that was, that was one of the the use cases that I had in this current red or in this, uh, red team I just wrapped up and, you know, they were worried about people just, you know, kind of non-technical people kind of trying to commit fraud and stuff. Um, and so if they weren't concerned that if that person didn't have access to a certain part of the function, uh, a certain part of the application, you know, be it a uh, CSR role or an admin role, they weren't worried about this person, like, you know, conducting some kind of crazy privilege escalation attack or, um, uh, anything like that. They were like, you know, these guys are not that intelligent. They're just going to be, you know, trying to like call people up and just like defraud their accounts. Um, so uh, again, we can use this information to kind of set up all of, you know, once we understand how the threats are going to attack the system, once we understand the system as a whole, you know, where we're going to attack it, 
uh, we can use this, these things to kind of lay out all these conditions that act as precursors to potentially malicious uh, activity. So identifying business goals and risks. Um, this is a big one. Um, actually, before we get into this slide. Oh, no. Uh, hang on. Sorry. Push that out a little bit longer. So, um, so again, as we're, as we're getting started with any kind of red team assessment, identifying what the business goals are. Um, we've kind of already touched on this, so I'll, I'll gloss right over this slide. Um, but as you're, as you're kind of, so from a, from a vendor perspective, or if you're trying to portray risk to upper management, um, as, you're, as you're spelling out a specific technical risk, so you know, be it a SQL injection or cross-site scripting or uh, you know, some buffer overflow that you found, uh, you want to try to map that, that technical risk back to a business risk. Because executives, people who are receiving these uh, these kind of reports, you know, the executives may not go through or or really care about the you know the hundred pages of report content that you put together. But you know, if you can get a snap a snapshot snapshot highlight um, in the in your executive summary that shows them, you know, these business or all these technical risks impact this business risk in you know X Y Z way, you know that may that may be a big eye opener for them, kind of be a budget allocator, uh, you know, kind of push for you guys if, uh, you know, you're the ones delivering this. So bringing software into the, uh, into the picture, obviously that, <coughs> excuse me, that's a big thing for us, uh, here at OWASP and, uh, here at Sigital. Um, so software is oftentimes what's handling our most sensitive assets, be it, uh, you know, SQL, uh, SQL queries, handling customer data on the back end and, you know, subsequently serving that up. You've got page content being served up, you know, all sorts of all sorts of things are being run and controlled by software nowadays. We know this. Um, the network guys haven't figured it out yet, but they'll catch up. Um, so in a lot of organizations, you know, you may have, you know, it might be a smaller group that only has, you know, one to ten, you know, one to five, something like that applications, but they're really important to you. And you've got bigger enterprises where they've got thousands and thousands of applications and <laughs> You know, they've just got code everywhere. They have no idea how to manage it all, and it's just kind of running rampant. Um, and scanning the network oftentimes does not give you the complete picture. So if you're just doing infrastructure scans, you're going to miss all that stuff on the application layer. So, you know, you may be fully patched. You may be, you know, only exposing HTTPS, and you may be configured properly. And great, from an infrastructure perspective, you are secure. you got an A-plus on your network report. Fantastic. You can go home, uh, get your bonus, whatever it happens to be. From an application layer, you may have all sorts of problems and your developers are going to be staying up at night, uh, you know, cursing, uh, cursing you for your, uh, your A plus star um, that you get to, you know, go home and put on your fridge or something for your network report. Um, so the application layer needs to be considered in, you know, getting this holistic security picture that we're trying to build from a red team assessment. Um, so we've touched on this already, um, the high risk of low risk applications. Um, so obviously you have shared assets. You've got um, a lot of times subdomains also. Um, and this will be uh, the lead into the story I'm going to tell you guys. Um, they provide a very, very good avenue because people are seeing the, you know, the, the domain that they're ultimately hopefully <laughs> going to land on. Uh, they're going to see that in the URL. So a lot of people are like, you know, to prevent phishing attacks, look at the URL. You know, that'll tell you if the URL is accurate, it's, you know, it's definitely not a phishing attack. It can't be because, because it can't be. Um, you know, they really don't have a good reason and they're wrong. Um, so this offers a very, very good avenue for, uh, for page rewrite phishing attacks. Um, and cross-component customer support roles are also pretty big. So if you, if you can call into one call center and, you know, get through one single kind of vulnerable process on one low-risk app, and again, if it affects a high-risk app, then, you know, it's money then you won. So the scenario that we, uh, that I'll walk you guys through, um, from a red team I did probably a year ago, it was on a really, really big bank, um, here in the U S and essentially, you know, we, we provided them all sorts of crazy attacks and, you know, had a lot of fun doing this assessment, but one of the ones that was, that was really interesting in particular. So they didn't have, uh, to lay a little bit of groundwork on you. Uh, it was kind of a limited scope. So they gave us four, four or five top level domains. And they said everything, you know, subdomains under that is all in scope. Everything, you know, network infrastructure wise that's related to that is all in scope. Um, their employees were not using any kind of like, you know, to get on their VPN. They didn't have any kind of like multi-factor <coughs> authentication. It was just, you know, domain credentials, you're in SSL VPN, 
wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And so we did all our testing. We did kind of our baseline against everything. We did our network scanning, all that, kind of gathered all the information. We got a whole ton of emails and all that from you know, just kind of scraping off of pages and just doing our reconnaissance. And on a lot of the, you know, what we expected to find, a lot of the high profile applications from this bank, you know, we didn't really find any issues. Um, you know, we couldn't, uh, in some cases, we couldn't create accounts or we couldn't get accounts to look at the post authentication functionality. And so we just weren't finding a lot of stuff. It was just content driven, um, you know, content being served up and then a login page. Not very interesting for us, unfortunately, from our unauthentic unauthenticated perspective. What we did find is on a lot of the low risk apps, we found a lot, a lot of cross site scripting issues. Uh, so what we did, and we found them on each subdomain. So what we did, uh, we put together this cross site scripting payload that essentially when you clicked on this link, it would execute each cross site scripting on you know, one cross site scripting from each subdomain. And they were using cookies that had, uh, you know, they, they were scoped to the parent domain. So once we got access to that cookie, it could also be used to access the high risk application um, or any high risk application that kind of fell under that top level domain. So uh, the cross site scripting payload executed uh, executed one on each on each top level domain um, from the vulnerable subdomain. We launched the attack. We found a flaw in their mail servers, so we launched launched the attack from their mail servers out to a whole bunch of people. You know, we sent it to kind of this uh, bonus. We created some like, you know, phony bonus program and we said, you know, if you enroll in this, you know, we're, we're rolling this out and piloting it. You guys are the lucky ones to get this, uh, you know, to get offered this, this kind of scenario. And, you know, if you, if you click here, then, you know, you want to click here to enroll and, you know, kind of it executed all the payloads really quickly. It took a little while to load and then we just landed them on a, on a domain site. Uh, or it was a login site and said, you know, this is, you know, we use JavaScript and all that to just rewrite the page how we wanted it. And just presented them this this login thing. As soon as we got their credentials, it just posted back to a server we had, and then we hopped on the VPN with uh, with people's credentials. And since we had all those cookies as well, we could access some internal apps that were also using that same cookie. Uh, we could access people's bank accounts, just all sorts of crazy stuff. And within within probably like thirty minutes, um, we had you know a couple hundred people yeah. go through this and you know successfully execute our attack. And, you know, I ended up pa passing through the, uh, the CEO's desk and he was, he was not happy because he didn't know about it. Uh, mm -hmm. So he was kind of pissed. So another thing, uh, mm -hmm. if you're working with and trying to get these things funded, make sure your sponsor is very well connected in the organization. Because our sponsor, even though he is very, very powerful in this group, his ass was on the line with regards to uh, because, you know, his boss, his direct report was not a happy camper about this. Um, because, you know, we got his information as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, he, uh, that, that was, uh, it was a really good example. Um, you know, and a lot of these problems that we identified, um, you know, the fact that. So the CEO signed up for a bonus program that he probably suspected. You would think he would have signed off on it, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, eh. well, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they signed enough stuff. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, we got all this, uh, all this good information and we identified these themes, you know, across your, across your organization, you know, obviously you have this risk management problem and, you know, you need to start subjecting some of these applications to some sort of, cause they were very, very basic issues. It's not like we had to like do all this crazy encoding to get our payloads to work or anything like that. It was very basic. If you were to run these things through a basic white hat or app scan scan or even burp suite scan, you would have found every, you know, everything on the low risk apps that we identified. Very easy. Um, and then you put all those things together and we had this like just terrifying scenario of, you know, transferring CEO's money out of his account. And I mean, if, and if we had done that on a, on a targeted scale where we're only going after a certain amount of people and we were on their, VP, you know, we were on their internal network with access to internal applications it's very likely it would have flied, you know, kind of flown under the radar of incident response. You know, we did it at scale because, you know, we're just like, we, we've already owned you guys so, you know, left and right with this assessment. We're just going to have fun with it. So we just threw the kitchen sink at them and uh, we got a lot of good stuff. Um, so that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. And that leads into, uh, you know, that's like picture perfect uh, attack, composite attack scenario. This is essentially what, uh, uh, you know, what ended up leading into that. So 
with, uh, with continuous red teaming. Um, so this is a concept that's kind of being developed as Sigital and, uh, you know, it's ongoing throughout the industry, you know, all this continuous assessment, continuous infrastructure scanning, continuous application scanning. You know, everyone's kind of adopting this approach because it, it matters. You know, things are constantly changing, you know, configurations, um, you know, implementing new technologies. You've got a lot of agile shops who are pushing code like, you know, what is a... Uh, uh, you know, some like Braintree, for instance, they're, they're pushing code like every 15 minutes or something. Uh, Groupon is the same way. They're just always pushing more code. And, you know, all those changes, you know, you have no idea if any of those changes kind of result in a uh, security vulnerability. So unless you're doing, you know, you don't have time in that situation. If you're pushing code every five minutes, you don't have time to step back and say, all right, we are going to do a static analysis on this, on this code. Then we have to submit it to pen testing. We have to do, we have to triage results first. Those have to go back, you know, get handled by developers. You know, let's go through the alerts process, all that. Then we have to go into a pen test, and it has to get a you know formal stamp of approval before this can get released. And all that has to happen in five minutes. Have fun. Um, it's not going to happen. So a lot of these agile shops just don't fit into the traditional. You know, we're gonna we're gonna do all these different security activities across your SDLC. Their SDLC is nuts. Um, and so oftentimes you end up just kind of catching up in production and that's the way it has to be. You know, that's their business model. You're probably not going to change that. Um, so, you know, you react, you adapt. So, you know, a lot of times open source reconnaissance, you know, we're going to have to really, really incorporate this, uh, into our process because, you know, we need to figure out when a company is kind of implementing uh, new features. We need to figure out if they've got some big, uh, you know, some big event happening that's going to increase likelihood of attack. Um, uh, things like that, where you know we know that an organization is kind of undergoing changes and you know maybe more uh, likely to be you know subject to certain vulnerabilities. Things like that. Um, we're also going to try to evaluate risks over time. We can identify trends. So you know, oftentimes when you implement. Anytime you implement a new feature, we know it's going to be vulnerable to, you know, we know you're not writing your SQL queries correct off the bat because every time you implement a new feature, we find SQL injection in it. You know, that means, you know, we identify a trend. We can tell you guys, you know, start pushing down some kind of secure coding guidelines internally. So that way that doesn't happen in production. You don't have SQL I in production. Um, you know, new network services, uh, you know, constantly coming out every time you, uh, you know, every time you, uh, you know, expose the FTP, you have anonymous, uh, anonymous, uh, login enabled, duh. But, um, obviously don't do that, but we've seen that, in, uh, in a few of our clients where, you know, every time they, they make some kind of configuration change and they're trying to do things very rapidly to try to, you know, appear sexy and, you know, up to date and, uh, you know, fast paced, they screw it up, um, because they're trying to move too fast and they're not thinking, uh, when they're doing it or they don't have processes in place to kind of protect themselves. Uh, the same goes for patches, configuration changes, all that stuff. Um, you know, and obviously uh, application functionality is always subject to breaking because, you know, more code, more bugs kind of thing. Um, so the scalability process. Um, so really this can be handled, you know, in much the same way that uh, a lot of the application and network scalability um, happens. You know, you kind of have this central the central brain, the central engine that's kind of launching out the, uh, launching these scans. As soon as one thing finishes up, you're going to start another one and you're going to constantly be collecting and triaging these results. Um, putting these things into, uh, you can track trends through, uh, through dashboards. So, you know, every, uh, every time we detect a change in a website, uh, we detect this new <laughs> vulnerability coming in, coming in and we can kind of, we can identify that very easily. That that's kind of stands out like a red flag. Um, you can also cross-reference things. You can you can keep a shared asset matrix. This is this allows you to kind of connect the dots on this continuous scanning model. Um, so you have this this matrix where you know you're tracking CSR functionality, you're tracking credentials, you're tracking uh, account registration, uh, certain processes, and all that. This is somewhat a somewhat manual task that we're trying to kind of work around right now to completely automate into the rest of it. Um, but cross-referencing that automatically with, you know, vulnerability trends, things like that, 
um, is going to be very important to you so that you can just have this kind of automated brain essentially stepping back and just constantly evaluating your organization. And then you supplement that with, you know, an actual red team of people who are going to kind of step back and, you know, they're going to monitor uh, the news. They're going to monitor uh, and just target your organization and kind of see how things are going and, uh, you know, constantly try to attack you because attackers oftentimes they're not going to, they're not going to try once or twice. They're not going to just go, you know, we didn't get in once walk away and, you know, that's it. Uh, things are done. You know, we're going to move on to the next company. They're going to keep trying. They're going to keep knocking on the door until they break it down and get in. Um, so that's kind of our approach or that our thought process here with the, uh, with the continuous scanning is, you know, eventually we'll, we will find a way in, uh, you know, we're not going to try the exact same thing every time. We're not going to just keep, uh, kind of hitting replay on our, on our scan button. So, you know, we run an application scan as soon as it finishes up, uh, you know, rescan or rescan, rescan, and to, you know, expect to find, you know, all, all these new crazy things happening. Um, so that is actually the end of this and, uh, kind of right on time. So unfortunately I did not get into any of, uh, my arrest stories or anything like that, but I will be around. If you guys want to hear about that, I w- will be more than happy to tell you about some of the, uh, the crazy shipping people into defense contractors and getting arrested and running from cops.